Hello and welcome again to the Writer Review. This is Eric Karat Writer, and this week we're going to be taking a look back at the 1999 fantasy comedy. It is a kind of a bit of a Twilight Zone Outer Limits type of movie. I guess you could say there's also even a bit of sci-fi in this movie too. The movie I'm talking about is Being John Malkovich. Now, Being John Malkovich runs for 1 hour and 53 minutes long. It is directed by Spike Jones. The script was written by Charlie Kaufman. This was their debuts. Of course, you know, Charlie Kaufman would go on to write other interesting other movies like Adaptation and Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, amongst many, many others. All right, it is produced by the former lead singer of the American group, R.E.M. I'm talking about, yes, Michael Stipe. Also joining him is uh, Sandy Stern, Steve Golan, and Vincent Lindsay. It is composed by Carter Burwell. The cinematography by Lance Accord. And it was edited by Eric Zombrunian. And the stars of the movie are John Cusack, Cameron Diaz, Catherine Keener, John Malkovich himself, not actually necessarily playing him, but an alternate character that's, well, he is playing John Malkovich, but not the John Malkovich. He's playing a completely different character from himself, who happens to ironically be John Malkovich. Also joining the cast includes Orson Bean, Mary Kay Place, Charlie Sheen as himself, but an alternate character, not the actual Charlie Sheen. We also have W. Earl Brown, Carlos Jacot, Bern Piven, and probably one of her more earlier roles, Octavia L. Spencer. Plus we also have cameos from... Director Spike Jones himself, Brad Pitt, Sean Penn, uh, director David Fincher, the three brothers who formed the band Hanson. We also have cameos from Winona Ryder and Andy Dick. Though many critics have been at the most very negative about Hollywood, and all the garbage they greenlit in the theater over the years. I'm not one of them. I think that underneath all the garbage and all the bullshit that they have thrown at us. Sometimes underneath 10 pounds of shit you'll probably find some hidden gold somewhere. You just have to dig deep. Even if you do come out smelling like crap. In 1999, a myriad of films cropped up that weren't afraid of taking risks. Going beyond one's imagination to create original content and thinking outside the box. When it comes to like these surrealist type movies. The only other name that I can actually think of. Well I could think of a few of them. But the closest I could actually ever think of. Is Terry Gilliam. Who has often took the risks to create original content. By going beyond one's imaginations. And creating a movie that only one could just simply imagine and turn that imagination into a reality. I mean, there are others too who have done that. I mean, imagination is limitless. And you could come up with all kinds of original things. Some might come out well, others will come out terrible. You know, it makes you just want to say, back to the old drawing board. Sometimes it'll 
explode in your face. Films like Fight Club, American Beauty, and A Straight Story all come in to tell stories that few people have ever told before and succeed in shining a light that every so often Hollywood can make good movies if it tries. But it's just that people just don't want to take risks. Is it because of finance? Is it because of fear? That it won't make money? Or is it because people are all just a bunch of lazy fucks who just want to make these crappy remakes and reboots that don't have any spine or soul to it? Sometimes I like to think maybe it's just all three. People just don't know how to create original stuff. So they say, you know what, let's just take a remake, fuck it over, and just pass it off as something that, that people will want to watch. One of the more triumphant films that came out in 1999 was... Being John Malkovich, which goes beyond one's imagination as we go on a journey to boldly explore some place that we have never been to before. Into the mind of a famous actor. So under the direction of Spike Jones, who previously directed music videos and commercials, and under the penmanship of Charlie Kaufman, being John Malkovich never shows any signs of shyness when people watch the entirety. It's a sigh of relief knowing that we have seen originality right before our eyes, and they aren't afraid to be quirky, daring, and even offensive at times. In fact, when you think about it, most of those characters in this movie don't even have any kind of redeeming qualities. It doesn't matter whether you're a protagonist or an antagonist. It's sometimes hard to see who is the less of who is the less evil of each of the characters because let's face it, almost every character are evil, immoral, unscrupulous, backstabbing assholes. I mean, maybe the only one that could be spared is John Malkovich. And even in the movie, this version of John Malkovich isn't really even that much of a saint either. It's true. The movie tackles around some heavy-hitting subject matter which includes gender identity, sexual orientation, or even just the thought of literally trying to live in another person's shoes. To the point where it's become an obsessive fixation. It felt like a combined effort of Terry Gilliam working with Lewis Carroll as they utilize their unorthodox frame of mind and create a magical tale that's whimsical, original, and visually stunning. Yes, these topics do come about in this movie. Maybe it's not like the central focal thing. I mean, the thing about Lottie's character, played by Cameron Diaz, contemplating of transforming herself from a woman to a man, was mentioned once. But then was never really ever mentioned again. That's kind of like probably a weakness in this movie. Is that sometimes a subject will come up and then it becomes a complete afterthought. And even at the end of the movie too. Lottie still continues to live her life as a woman. Even though she, she was contemplating of becoming transgender. But like I said it's just probably it was just a contemplation but never really fully materialized. Maybe it's just gone through like a scene of the moment type of thing. But we'll get more into the plot devices in this movie because there's 
quite a lot that needs to be undertaken. So John Cusack stars here as an unemployed puppeteer by the name of Craig Schwartz. Well, actually, he during the spring and summer seasons, he's a like a street puppeteer who creates these puppets, but they're not there to like entertain the little kitties. No, actually, his marionettes seem to get involved in rather adult-themed stuff, making you making proof that the puppets aren't the only thing that is made from wood. See, they even got me being a perverted pig. Just by that joke alone. So the puppets were being woody both figuratively and literally. I'm going to say one thing about John Cusack in this movie. My God, he looks really unrecognizable as he's sporting a beard, long hair, and glasses. You know, usually when you think of John Cusack, I think of, uh, you know, a handsome guy, dark hair, brown eyes. You know, immaculate looking, always dressed prim and prop. You never quite see him look like so disheveled, so frumpy looking. He is stuck in a rather drab marriage to Lottie, played by Cameron Diaz, who also looks unusually unattractive here. Usually when I see Cameron Diaz, the thing I visualize of her is, you know, like, short blonde hair, cute, adorable kind of look about her. She's got this upper-middle-class, girl-next-door type persona about her. Hair, once again... She has this kind of unattractive appeal towards her in this movie. Not necessarily like like a Broomhilda type of frumpiness, but still, you know, curly blonde hair, very frumpy looking. <clears throat> Always dresses like she's just going to take out the garbage type of look. You know, wake up in the morning just to take the garbage and go back in her house. You know, that's the type of, that's the type of look she's got there. She's the only one who has, like, more uh, sufficient employment. As she works in a pet store, so their apartment th that that Craig and Lottie live in are surrounded by animals. You know. It's very... It's very, you know, noisy. Not exactly a very tidy background, but... And like I said, the relationship between Craig and Lottie are very, very, very dysfunctional and not very well loved he feels that his love and devotion towards marionettes doesn't seem to have the same appeal to his audience i mean like one time he was doing a street puppet show and this little girl is like like oh daddy look a puppet show and so their father goes over and watches the puppet show only to realize that the puppet show is not telling some kind of cute fairy tale. No, it just shows a puppet having sex with another female puppet. To the point where the father actually just punches him right in the nose. For, for showing mature subject matter with his puppet's towards his little girl. I mean, okay, perfectly understandable, but who says that puppetry has to necessarily be for kids? You know. Knowing that the fall season is coming, so Craig is pretty much left without a job. So 
eventually he takes a job at the... I forget the name of the place. The Merton... Flemmer building somewhere in New York City. Anyways, he gets a job at a file clerk at a seven and a half floor building in New York City. And you're wondering, what the hell is a seven and a half floor? And uh, the only answer I could think of is good answer. Good question. Okay, well, first of all, once you reach the seventh floor, you have to stop it on your own merit. Once you get around to the halfway mark. And you don't, and it doesn't, the elevator doesn't stop on its own. You have to pull the lever. And because it's seven and a half, you know, you have to kind of walk in by kind of scrunching down. The ceilings are rather low. And I think that once you enter the seven and a half floor, this is where all the weirdness starts to really fully materialize. And we feel like that we've entered into some like weird dimension and we only just got started. I mean, he's joined by a secretary who seems to be somewhat hard at hearing. Craig gets hired by some eccentric geriatric named Dr. Lester, played by Orson Bean, and works alongside a seductive co-worker by the name of Maxine Lund, played by Catherine Keener, who I think is probably easily one of the most despicable, most unscrupulous bitches that I have ever met in my entire life. Oh, and then that's not to say that, the, you know, the secretary, Mary Kay Place, is any much better. I mean, she always seems to somewhat mistake his name, calling him Clark even though he says his name is Craig, or, you know, things like that. Or And Dr. Lester, when it came to, like, the job interview, he's asking all these kind of weird questions, or gives him some kind of, like, little tests and all, like, if he could put these numbers together, which one goes first? And then he shows him an object that's neither a letter or a number or something like that that's not a letter. Hey, you're learning fast. And uh, sometimes he even says some openly, like, upfront lecturous things towards his secretary. You know, things like that could get you a lawsuit. But I guess, you know, he gets his own way. I mean, he talks about how he wants to fuck his secretary. You know, things like that could get you into a whole deep pile of lawsuits. You know, you don't say those kind of things in public, but you know what? Hey, he doesn't give a fuck anyway. In fact, a lot of these characters could say things out of proportions without any kind of repercussions. I mean, Maxine Lund probably spends a lot of her movie practically dissing and putting Craig down in any way, shape, or form. I mean, if she won't put you down physically, she can also put you down mentally. I mean, she's always constantly putting him down in any kind of way, asking all kinds of other weird questions, even going as far as to even go the level of, of, of homophobia by even asking Craig if he's a fag. I mean, it's like, you don't ask questions like that. Are you in your 30s or are you in your teens? Only teenagers ask these kind of questions. It's like a lot of these characters probably never escaped their adolescent ways of thinking. I mean, when you're an adult, you don't ask these questions or say these kind of sexual innuendos in public unless you're a teenager. And, and not just, you know, any moral teenagers, but immoral ones. But most of these people are immoral individuals who... who who, who do unapologetic antics and say unapologetic stuff without any care of a repercussion or, or who 
one's feelings or whose body they trample over. They're the type of people who will step on your fingers by accident, but since they look the reaction, they'll step on your fingers again. That's the kind of people who we're dealing with in this movie. There is no redeeming quality. I'm not saying Craig is a saint because no, he isn't either. But Maxine is practically the absolute worst. So one day Craig was alone in the office doing his file clerk stuff. You know, just boring random bullshit. When he stumbled across what looked like a portal. Curiously, Craig goes into the portal. But this portal leads towards a slippery tunnel. Which leads Craig into the mind of famed actor John Malkovich. And then everything turns into insane madcap madness. Craig goes into Malkovich feeling that this is, you know, this is cool. This is an opportunist. I think Craig actually may have some kind of self-esteem issues, being that he doesn't like himself too much. So much to the point where he just wants to be somebody else. That's one of the reasons why I guess he took up puppeteering, is because he just wants to be somebody else. I mean, of course, this is the wrong impression when you get to doing performance art, when you're doing, like, either playing a character and acting or puppeteering or anything else where people think that the reason why they do these kind of jobs is simply because they have a hidden hatred towards themselves. That's totally not true. Some people just like to act because they find that they're actually organically good at it. Are puppeteering because they're organically good at it. It isn't to hide some kind of sense of self-loathing. But that's the impression I get in this movie. That the reason why people try to pretend to be somebody other than themselves. Not true at all. Let's just keep that in mind. Charlie Kaufman's script is unapologetically illogical and twisted. So that fans would like to see more films like this one. But the best part is we can never fully grasp of what's going through the head as we await what will happen through each line. And of course this whole idea of entering into the mind of, of John Malkovich gave both Craig and Maxine Uh, some cash on the side, you know, like, people will just line up for $250 just to go into the mind of John Malkovich. Because, let's face it, the movie's main focal point is about control. Everyone wants control. And it's just so unfortunate that Malkovich himself has to be the unfortunate guinea pig that people want to control. Like. Nobody wants to be controlled. No other human being wants to be controlled by somebody else. And that's one of the things about why Craig took up puppetry. Is for control. Because when you're a puppeteer. You're the boss. You get to do as much manipulation as you can. Maxine herself could be almost like a puppeteer in the more metaphoric sense, being that she loves to take control over people. In fact, you know, once Craig tells Lottie about this whole being John Malkovich thing, she decides to get curious herself to go into the portal and to see what it's like, and all of a sudden, she's like on cloud nine. She's on Euphoria. And she said that this is like the greatest experience she's ever had, being in the body of a man, which led her to make her believe that she would be just more comfortable if she was a man herself. Which kind of brings up this whole transgender type of ideology that was bestowed upon her. But like I said, it was only mentioned once and was never mentioned again. 
But Maxine not only is a controller, she's also a bit of a home wrecker too. I mean, when Craig invited Maxine to dinner, all of a sudden, what Craig, who often defined Maxine as uh, kind of like the woman of her dreams, suddenly Maxine just does not feel that in him. In fact, she wants really not very much or anything to do at all with Craig. But when she saw Lottie, she was like, it was like love at first sight. And that, and that Maxine would love nothing more to be a part of Lottie's life. And Craig can simply just go fuck himself. Of course, you know, this led, this, of course, Craig feeling that he's lost the woman of his dreams, Maxine, while also at the same time losing his wife because Maxine has, has kind of stepped up as being attracted to Lottie. Of course, that also makes her kind of hypocritical, especially... That she often questioned if Craig was was a fag. Um, she realizes that she has home wrecked Craig and Lottie's relationship, even though they weren't really actually on good terms. And now she's in a relationship with Lottie, leaving Craig in the lurch. So then Craig eventually, his path to madness starts to materialize. I mean, all of a sudden he's got a gun. He points it at, at, at Lottie. And then he puts her in a cage. And then eventually, because he, he heard that Maxine has been has been uh, has been flirting inside the mind of John Malkovich while John Malkovich has been you know somewhat in a relationship with Maxine that's not necessarily in Malkovich's conscious but somebody is you know fucking around with his mind well eventually they also start a relationship and Eventually, Maxine ends up getting pregnant. Oh, and by the way, do you know what happens after you get out of the mind? You know how you can get out of the mind of of John Malkovich? I forgot to mention. The only way to get out of the mind of John Malkovich is you almost get like spit out, and you land and you wind up in the New Jersey Turnpike. So yeah, eventually Maxine is now pregnant with John Malkovich's child. Although John Malkovich is not necessarily the biological father. It's actually Lottie who got into the mind of John Malkovich. But Malkovich was like, once again, the guinea pig who had sex with Maxine, and now she's with child. <clears throat> and but then again, Craig's obsession of just wanting to be John Malkovich takes a turn for greater proportions as he decides to become a permanent host to the mind of John Malkovich and not wanting to get out. In fact, he was actually in there for eight months. John Malkovich, who is being controlled by Craig, eventually decides to give up his job as as a actor and to take up puppeteering. But he eventually ends up becoming his own puppet. And, uh, you know... Craig eventually gets his 
eight months of ex of exagger of of fame, and that this leads to Lottie to actually confront Doctor Lester who says that he's been alive for the past 104 years and he knows all about the whole host jumping into a person's mind and that somehow the curse is going to have to be broken by the time John Malkovich celebrates his 44th birthday. And the only way he will ever be relieved or to become a host is if Craig gets out of the mind of John Malkovich. Before, and you know, he and his friends could actually end up being, being a permanent resident in the mind of John Malkovich. Also, you know, Lottie also has this whole idea that she, of course, would rather be in a relationship with a manipulative bitch like Maxine Lund, saying things like, if I can't have you, no one else will, type of scene where she actually points a gun. Yeah, there's a lot of very confusing issues here in this movie. So let's go right to the climax. Yeah, oh, don't, oh, don't worry, Lottie eventually does escape. I believe it was with the assistance of her... of her ape friend, what was his name? Elijah. I don't remember what species of ape he was. I think he was an orangutan. But I don't remember. I know it was not a gorilla. It was more of a smaller type of ape. Being, I guess, an orangutan or a chimpanzee. I don't remember. Anyways, it was part of the simian family. Anyhow, yeah. The climax comes when... Craig finally gets out of the mind of uh, John Malkovich. He is, of course, eventually joined by Lottie and Maxine. They both hop into a car. They tell Craig to fuck off. And Craig decides that he was going to go one more time back into the mind of John Malkovich in hopes that things work out. But unfortunately, once he tries to escape the portal, since now that Dr. Lester and his friends have now gone into the mind of John Malkovich, John Malkovich's mind is now permanently shut. Which means that Craig cannot get out of the portal. Oh, but don't worry. Is Craig completely dead? No. So now Maxine and Lottie are now a happy couple. Oh, don't worry, Lottie still remains a female, even though she was contemplating of becoming a male, but that was just an afterthought. So they... So they raise a daughter... How did they get a daughter? Well, when Lottie was John Malkovich, he may have did the job, but she got the child. So she is the biological father to Maxine's child. I guess it goes to show you that fathers don't necessarily have to come in the male persuasion. Anyhow, yeah. 
So I guess they decided to live a happy life with raising their seven-year-old daughter, Emily. Oh, by the way, Craig has now entered the mind of his own daughter. Which kind of makes him a little powerless. Oh, and Dr. Lester is also not completely gone. I mean, he's entered the mind of John Malkovich. We see an uh, image of Malkovich looking a little older. Charlie Sheen himself looking a little older, even though if you really know that even by 2022 standards, they don't look like the way they look now. Or looked in that movie. Charlie Sheen, as far as I know, still has a full head of hair. Here we see him with receding hairline. Yeah. Hey, yeah, it's just an interpretation of what they would look 20 years later. It's just an assumption. And that Dr. Lester, who's in the mind of John Malkovich, is going to say that by the time Emily is celebrating her 44th birthday, he is going to enter her mind. But for the time being, she Emily can enjoy the life's of having two mothers while Craig is working and manipulating her mind. In other words, Craig is kind of like vicariously still around. But he's just not going to, but he's been kind of demoted to being just a mind manipulator inside their daughter. Yeah. Aren't these people such nice individuals? <laughs> I'd rather be chewed off with a, by a Rottweiler. I'd rather my face chewed off with a Rottweiler than to be associated with any of these despicable, disheartening degenerates. I mean, I, I mean, I do have to admit the costumes were pretty much very well thought of. You know, I mean, I thought Cameron Diaz did quite the job of sacrificing her own beauty by sporting a frizzy wig and frumpy clothes. She definitely makes most of her time entering through the mind of John Malkovich, who plays himself here, but not like the real John Malkovich, but just an alternative version of him. Second of it, to the point where she engages in intercourse with Maxine while taking control of Malkovich, which inspires her of having a sex change, but we all know that's an afterthought. I just think it's just cruel to just try to go into the body of somebody just to, just to have the moment alone, just to have the moment of being this person. But then sometimes I often wonder... What would happen if the host himself went into his own body? At least we get to see that. I mean, once John Malkovich tries to, to, to understand what the hell is going on, he decides to go to the Seven and a Half building to know, what, to know what the fuck is happening and why is he doing the things that he usually never usually does. Oh, and by the way, Craig and Maxine actually let him in for free. Being that he is the John Malkovich. Which is and, and actually something really weird happens when he himself goes into his own mind. All of a sudden we see everybody going around looking like John Malkovich. And they all have this kind of robotic look towards them. And the only words they could say is Malkovich, 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 everybody. Everybody all has these, everybody all looks, acts, and talks like John Malkovich. It almost reminds me of that Bugs Bunny cartoon where some guy thinks he's a rabbit. And all of a sudden, Bugs Bunny starts playing mind games and fucking up his mind to the point where even he himself thinks that he's a rabbit. 
which eventually eventually he gets so depressed that he actually jumps off a building and lands jumps off a bridge and decides to plunge to his own death. Very cruel episode, if you ask me. And it's probably one of the cruelest things that Bugs Bunny has ever done to an antagonist. And believe me, Bugs Bunny has done a lot of horrible things to his adversaries. Sure, they all want him killed, and sometimes he has to use some kind of self-defense to overcome his adversaries. But by God, sometimes the things that Bugs Bunny does is cruel and horrible and mean-spirited. Anyhow, the best part about this movie is that each of the performers seem to bask in the insanity of the script, going all out to add something to the zaniness that they're not afraid of. Cusack succeeds as the unlucky Schwartz. Diaz is wonderful as the animal-loving wife, Lottie, and Keener, and Keener, she is just awesome as the sexy but untrustworthy degenerate co-worker. And even Mary Kay Place, who has a small role, she also is quite wonderful as the absent-minded receptionist. But the one character who's having the most fun at poking the bear is the bear himself. John Malkovich. Not only does he play himself as a character, he's brave enough to be used and manipulated as a prop. Yes, a human prop. For a man who's built a solid reputation as a character actor, a theatrical genius who's done his craft that spanned almost five decades, he went out of his way to parody himself but had other performers in mainstream media to expose, to expose how shallow and egotistical they really are. But I think it also may have a reflection of humanity itself. I think in the world we live in, for the survival of the fittest, we all have to be self-absorbed, self-centered, and self-assuring just to get our, our own ways. And sometimes we don't give... A flying fuck as to whose hands we step on. If we have a reaction, we'll step on your hands again. Just for the laughs. But the best part, like I said, was when Malkovich enters his own mind and sees a bunch of Malkovich replicas, almost as if it looks like a cult. It's something that people talked about doing, but never attempted until now. The movie overall doesn't rely on allegory, but still has enough to entertain, amuse, and say to yourself, Hollywood does make good films. They just need to be brave enough and can't be afraid of taking risks. And that's really what makes this movie really stand out. So therefore, if I was to give this movie a scale out of 10, I would give Being John Malkovich from 1999 Oh. A 9 out of 10. So I guess this ends my ride review. Thank you all for listening in. If you wish to subscribe to my YouTube channel, please feel free to do so. If you wish to leave a comment, go right ahead. But just remember the three simple rules. Be kind, be courteous, and please refrain from any rude comments. And I'll be back again with another movie review. So until next time, this is Eric Correct Writer saying, keep watching those movies, and I'll see you around. Goodbye.